All right, great, fantastic. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'd like to start by, uh, I guess, suggesting that geo browsers are really still in their infancy, and that this is really important because it colors our perception of what's possible. Uh, if you have a mature industry, it's easy to believe that much of what's important has already been done. But by comparing the state of geo browsers with that of page browsers, we can get a better sense of, of kind of where we stand. So the CERN line mode browser, for example, that Tim Berners-Lee wrote was released in the spring of 91. And Netscape wasn't even uh, founded for another three years. And Firefox didn't become available in 10 years after. So if we think about the state of affairs this way, uh, today's geo browsers are really at about the same point as uh, IE 1.0. So we're still in the point cast days. Uh, Excite hasn't even gone public. This means that now is really a great time to be involved in geospace. Because today's mapping applications and mashups are going to get a whole lot better because the tools we use to author and consume them are going to get much better. And not only that, but it's likely, as Michael Jones of Google has said, that geo browsers will become as ubiquitous as page browsers. But if you think about this space, much of the innovation has been centered around uh, the desktop uh, and not mobile applications. So I'd like to talk about a mobile application that we developed. Uh, Earthscape ARS is an augmented reality system uh, designed for use by law enforcement professionals in helicopters. Uh, and I'd like you to keep in mind as I describe it that this is an application written for a geo browser uh, similar to, uh, to Google Earth or Virtual Earth that we've been developing. So mounted on the bottom of pretty much every helicopter used by the military or police is this uh, gyro-stabilized gimbal-mounted infrared camera, uh, like the one we're seeing here. Here's a close-up of that. These range from about a quarter million dollars for this one to uh, a little over a million dollars for this one here. Uh, these allow the cops to see it at, at night. Uh, so if you imagine for a second that you're a police officer in one of these helicopters, uh, this is the cockpit that they're looking at. And you see over on the left-hand side there, uh, that video monitor, that's where the tactical control officer, the TCO, sits. And he's viewing the video from the camera there. Uh, so in this shot, we can see this, this person at work here. Uh, they, they do know how to fly the helicopter, uh, but they're phenomenally busy. So they're responsible for finding and keeping an eye on the bad guys, uh, knowing where both the helicopter and any suspects are at, and communicating with any officers on the ground, and operating half a dozen radios. So it's a very, very difficult job. And the way they were trying to figure out where the camera was looking just didn't make any sense to us. Uh, basically, they were using a, a moving map, very similar to a, a Tom Tom or a Garmin Nuvi that you might buy in Circuit City, except that they were tied into the gimbal electronics to get a rough idea of where the camera was pointing. Now, there's all kinds of problems with this. I mean, first off, almost none of them knew the orientation of the helicopter, so the predicted location could be wildly inaccurate. Uh, second, the perspective looked nothing like what the officer was seeing on his monitor, and most importantly, you had to take your eyes off the suspect in order to figure out where he was at. So, I mean, that's obviously a bad thing. These guys are flying late at night. Uh, if it's a felony suspect fleeing a scene, he could be driving with his lights off. Uh, and you might be several miles away from him when or if uh, you're lucky enough to pick him up. And that's actually important to note. Uh, a lot of times, these guys aren't able to find suspects when they go there. So if you are fortunate enough to pick up someone uh, on your camera, you don't want to lose him. Uh, you know, no cop wants to be responsible for some mass murderer getting away because he was trying to figure out where he was at to radio to the guys on the ground. Uh, so here's what we did. We got a military-grade inertial measurement unit, or IMU. This is the sort of thing that tells you the position and orientation of a device that you attach it to. Uh, some of these do-it-yourself drones use a, uh, you know, kind of a, a lower precision version of these things that we'll be hearing about. Uh, so the IMU on this case here is up near the top. You can see we've got a, a little motherboard and um, a 12-volt battery here. We stuck this thing in a van. Uh, we started driving around with it, trying to you know, get our software to, uh, to work with it and operate with it. And once we thought we had something useful, uh, the next thing we did is start getting airtime with the Denver Police Department. So there it is in the, uh, the helicopter there. Now, if your first thought is anything like my first thought, uh, it might be, hey, this is going to be great. We get to fly around, see the sights, you know, maybe take in a car chase. Uh, this will be a lot of fun, right? Uh, the thing you learn fairly quickly is that these guys don't fly like sightseeing tours in Hawaii do. Uh, these are guys with a job to do. It can involve flying uh, either very aggressively at times uh, or simply orbiting a crime scene for a long time. Uh, and either way, you're probably going to get sick. And the programmers in the audience know that there's what the documentation says the hardware is supposed to do, 
and then there's what the hardware actually does. Uh, and the only way to figure out what it actually does is to test it in an operation. So here's one of our guys hacking code in the air. Uh, would be doing this while pulling two Gs and making 60-degree uh, banks at times. So it's, it's definitely not a cubicle-like environment. Uh, the end result, however, is that if you know where the helicopter is, and the IMU told us that, uh, and you know where the camera is pointing and what its field of view is, then you have all of the parameters necessary to tell a geo browser, something like Google Earth, we've developed our own, but you have all of the parameters necessary to tell a geo browser how to render that view. And this is what it looks like if you do that 60 times a second. You get a computer-generated image uh, using satellite or aerial imagery that looks like what you would see on the monitor in the daytime. Only because it's all computer-generated, we can add some useful information. Uh, street names, for example. And, you know, you can tell this is synthetic. There's no cars moving. With, you know, we've got high-resolution imagery there. Uh, the big win, though, comes from doing something simple. If you turned off our aerial imagery and you replaced it with live video, then what you can do is you can overlay the streets in real time on top of the video. So the very first night that we had all these pieces working, we were able to give the officers on the ground the precise address of a property we saw a suspect hiding at, uh, and they later recovered a gun. Now, without this system, uh, they might have been able to find that gun, but the helicopter would have had to remain on station orbiting the entire time. So this is a huge improvement in making effective use of a very expensive asset. Um, here we're looking at some uh, vector overlay data. Uh, a lot of times this is provided to us by the municipality as shape files. Uh, but we could also use data from Navtech or Teleatlas. We could use KML files if they're available. Uh, and you'll see uh, individual parcels being highlighted here along with their address. We can display anything that the municipality has. So we can display the building owner, their phone number, uh, whatever could be useful for the officers. Uh, and uh, I think I said earlier this would be really fun. Uh, sometimes it actually is uh, when you know, it's a, a nice evening and there's not a whole lot of crime going on. Uh, you get to fly around, see the city. It is really beautiful. Uh, so I'd like to go back uh, to kind of where I started. And I, I said that uh, we're still in the early days of geo browsers. And I'd submit that one of the ways you can verify that's the case uh, is by noting the extraordinary degree of change and innovation we're seeing. So I mean, whether it's Google adding Street View or uh, Microsoft with their incredibly detailed buildings, uh, or our own company's focus on enabling developers to build applications, you know, the feeling you get is, uh, is similar to the, you know, the early to mid-90s when the page browser wars were in full swing. So I'd like to wrap up, I guess, by, by describing kind of five lessons that we learned. Um, so first is, geo-browsers are fantastic on the desktop. I mean, it's, it's great fun to zoom in all these different places in the world. But they can save lives or otherwise dramatically improve things out in the field. Uh, and the applications of augmented reality uh, go far beyond law enforcement and military roles. Uh, you know, whether it's in the aftermath of a disaster uh, or whether it's uh, as an aid to fire departments like the, uh, the CAL FIRE information we saw this morning, uh, there's gonna, you're going to find more and more of this out there. Uh, second off, I mean, it's been said a million times, uh, you need to eat your own dog food. Earthscape ARS, it, it's not just a commercial product for us. It was a way for us to kind of test our geo browsers engine, uh, make sure that we were solving the kinds of problems that we thought people out in the field might want to do with the geo browser. So the process of using our own API uh, really forced us to, to kind of improve the product. And something we learned while eating our own dog food was that to do anything much more interesting than display dots or lines on a map, uh, you need a geo browser that's programmable, something that you can, you can customize. Um, you, know, you just couldn't build an application like this using KML. Uh, and I think all of us who remember kind of the early days of the internet, or the web browsers, um, you know, remember the pre-JavaScript days, uh, we, where the web just kind of felt dead. Uh, it's the J and Ajax that makes uh, Web 2.0 apps so much more interesting than 1.0 apps. It's, it's HTML and JavaScript that we're looking at right now. Uh, fourth, not surprisingly, uh, first responders have a very low tolerance for their tools not working. Uh, and I already have enough speeding tickets that uh, I don't need to get anyone's bad side. So putting a product in this kind of environment really forces you to focus on the fundamentals. Uh, if you can find an early set of customers that have very high performance expectations and meter exceed those, you've got a good base for everyone else. 
Uh, and lastly, second, it's something we learned by accident. Uh, you don't see a whole lot of long development cycles anymore, but if you're forced into one like we were, I think conventional wisdom would have you uh, develop for the very high end with the expectation that by the time you get to market, uh, it'll be kind of ready for the mass market. We weren't able to do that. We had to target these, these ruggedized flight certified computers, which are a couple of generations behind. But in doing so, uh, it was those tight constraints of those first computers we used that allowed us to get our engine out there and running on the, the iPhone very easily. Um, so, you know, I'd like to, to finish up by saying thanks for your time. Uh, if anyone would like to play around with one of these things, we have uh, the actual system that the cops are flying with out at the Warfare, and uh, you guys can see what it feels like to, to use one in the air. Yeah. Thanks.